can't do anything about it. <laughs> Teach Out was not an invented name in the 60s, despite what you might think. Uh, I grew up in rural Vermont. I've been thinking about that a little recently because one of my jobs, um, my, my folks, my dad teaches law, my mom's a judge, but they get a lot of land and a lot of sort of, you know, those victory gardens that are five acres large and chickens and sheep and a pig. And then my dad gets it in his head that we should get a bull. And he was not ready for this bull. So we put the bull in a sheep fenced in area. <laughs> And the bull got out. And so we spent all November chasing this bull around the field. And finally, my father figured out the way to get the bull back. And this was a problematic bull, because it not only was it out, but it was trampling the neighbor's corn, ruining our relationships with all the neighbors, making difficulties, showing up on the road when it shouldn't. So I was a fast little kid. I, was, uh, I actually ended up winning New England's cross country champions at one point, but I was an eight year old fast little kid. And so he realized the thing to do was to get me to go walk up to the bull, tickle it on the nose, and then run as fast as I could back into the fence. <laughs> I climb back over the fence and then slam the door. So I'm thinking about running for governor. <laughs> I would love to be the governor of New York. But I would also love to get this governor of ours back inside the Democratic fold, get a little discipline, actually listen to the deep, uh, very you know, heartfelt concerns and love and care of the Democrats of this state. For instance, uh, when I am running, I hope the governor cannot make his little move to allow fracking in New York, but in fact feels pressure. to announce a commitment to protecting our state from poison and a commitment to sustainable energy, which we can do. There's a wonderful plan out there, the Jacobson plan, that I think we should pursue on the sun, solar, and wind in the state, um, which would not only create a sustainable state, but also create jobs. And we've seen in the last four years you know, more jobs than expected in some areas because of a commitment to sustainable energy. It is embarrassing that New York is not leading on this. The state of New York and the public of New York wants to lead on this, and is the governor and his interest in himself and his big donors that is keeping us from doing that. So while I am running again, I would also like to make this governor face up to the fact that he spent one day in a public school in his four years in office and completely abandoned schools. He started off proposing, as you may recall, the largest cut in education funding in state history. And then shows no, I mean, it's great to listen to you, but just shows no understanding of the complexity of what it means to care for and raise and teach a, a small person. Uh, I went to Yale after being a rural Vermonter, and uh, my first job out of Yale was teaching special ed in a small rural school. And I think all the time about what the kids that I was working with, how they would have responded to high stakes testing, putting pressure on their teachers. And how the kids that I was working with, how they would have dealt with enormous class sizes, no art, not the music, not, the, not all the life that you need to become a complete person. <coughs> with Astorino and Cuomo alone, we can't actually be talking about education the way that we should be talking about it. Um, now, I also want to talk a little bit about the way the governor has uh, repeatedly promised to pass some serious reform on public financing and elections, things that would actually change the structure of what it means to wake up in the morning and be a politician in the state. I want, I want people to be able to wake up in the morning and say, if I go to lots of these little clubs, I can raise enough money to become governor, comptroller, pick your, pick your position. He seems quite happy with the position that he needs to make just a handful of phone calls to the richest people, some of the richest people in world history, many of whom are not Democrats, and see what, where that gets him. I'm happy to take questions afterwards about sort of any more policy areas. There's things I know about, there's things I'm learning about. I, as a law professor, I'm probably a little too into the weeds on the policy, but, but I think we need to be talking seriously about economic policy and not just accepting the trickle-down economic policy that we're getting from this allegedly Democratic governor. 
Uh, so where I am is uh, I will know in the next, I don't know, Mike, how, 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 how soon will I know? Day or two. The next day or two. <laughs> Mike Bowen is my fantastic campaign manager. And this is Chloe King on her first day on the job. <laughs> Party approached me in late March, and I thought about it for, you know, 30 seconds. Yeah. I pretended to think about it for a month, and I had to get my work in order. I had to make sure that I was I was really deeply comfortable on a personal level with taking the attacks that I know are going to come, and I am. I can I can live with them. Uh, but I but I was very excited about the opportunity, and I continue to be very excited about the opportunity. The only question is whether I can make a credible run. And that's just about resources. So I'm, uh, I've been doing fundraising all week, and my voice is worse. That's why. I've been talking to uh, many friends, family, people I haven't seen in 25 years uh, to put together the, the basic, what you know, we call the nut, basically, the thing that we need to do to make mount a credible challenge and to be ready for the attacks that we know are going to come. If I can hit that, we're going. And if I can't, we're not. So uh, that's, that's the truth. My commitment in this campaign is. I'm going to tell the truth. Um, I believe that right now there's just a sense that not only is politics distorted by money, but political language is distorted by this kind of political speech. And I don't gain anything by that, and you don't gain anything by that. So uh, that's my commitment. I really appreciate you guys taking the time on your full schedule tonight to, uh, to say hello. And uh, if you have any questions, I think we have a few minutes for questions. So what happens? Right. Well, <laughs> you want to know what happened to the bull? Oh. Uh, we sold it and it was slaughtered. Oh. 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 Back in. Are you oh, no, 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 not back in the fence. Sorry, but then my father realized he couldn't handle it. Yeah, yeah. You know, we just weren't, we were just weren't set up for it. Okay, I'll call, I'll call people and okay, one, two, three, four. Even exactly. if you win, you're still gonna have to deal with Jeff Biden. This guy, five, who are actually the ones really running the city. Cuomo's not even running the city. It's, it's Jeff Klein and this gang of five that are stopping the 10-point women's agenda, everything progressive you can name. So you could run and you could win, but how could you stop the influence of somebody like Jeff Klein? Yeah, so the way I think about it, I mean, look, I, I'm no superhero. This is going to be a New York State effort. Right. And uh, what I hope is that by telling the truth and by talking to the real concerns of the people who want to live in this very different New York, I mean, if New Yorkers voted, none of these fools would be, <laughs> you know, you know, seriously. So one of the goals is to actually bring out the progressive New Yorkers who feel totally forgotten and ignored right now. Right. That may not happen in one cycle, but I'd like it to happen in one cycle. That means talking far more to people under 40 than a lot of politicians do. That means going to communities that aren't usually gone to. You know, one of our core commitments is to say, we're not just looking at the numbers on the polls of the likely voters. We right. want to go to parts of the state that people ignore. Um, that's a collective effort. So that, that's, that's the way that I think about it. Because you're right. One position isn't everything. Right. Thank you. John? I'm just wondering what you know, if you're going to run for governor. Uh -huh. What party are you trying to... Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm running for governor on the Democratic Party line. I am a Democrat. Uh, when I talked to the Working Families Party, I said, I'll run on your line, but I would love to also run in the Democratic primary. So do you have petitions and so on for us? Uh, Mike Bolin, right back here, we, we, I'll tell you, the two things I need are petitions and money. And petitions are worth money, and money is worth petitions. So uh, anybody who wants to help petitioning, Mike Bolin, my campaign manager, will talk to you. Yeah. Jim? Uh, thank you for coming, number one. There are two issues that I would like you to address. One is the issue of home rule. Yes. A lot of it same issues for New York City. The other is, is what Cuomo did with Medicaid mm. by privatizing it. Mm. And, and it's just horrible for anyone who is on Medicaid. And all of the uh, affordable care people that are coming in on Medicaid, it's terrible what he did. Yeah, so I'm, a, I'm completely committed to home rule. I mean, there's just what, what we see happening. The idea that, a, that 
You can't be solving the very serious problems that you see. What was it? Yesterday's the average rent in, in Brooklyn is now like 2,800. Um, there's so many different ways in which what I see Cuomo doing is taking away power from people. I see that also in property taxes, by the way. You know, just not only not only am I going to limit your funding, but I'm not even going to let you try to solve your own problems. So it's a deep philosophical commitment of mine. Uh, I'll be honest with you, one of the areas that I need a lot more uh, training on is healthcare. I'm committed to single payer, that's where I want to get to. Um, and so the questions for me are what are the intermediate steps we can get there? And I have some meetings set up after I'm done with my fundraising on like what are the particular policies we can push? Uh, because I, I just feel like we've got to get to single payer. We've got to, you know, the, the number of hospitals also that have closed under Cuomo's watch is quite depressing. You know, this basic job of a governor is to care and protect and listen. And none of those things I see happening. I just wanted to say, I'm sure we're all thrilled and I'm thrilled to have you here. But I wanted to ask you, uh, have you been speaking with Bill Samuels? Are you possibly the one in the panels? I uh, am very close to Bill Samuels. Uh, he's been helpful. Uh, I, my only hesitation is I want to... Uh, yeah. Mike. Yeah. <laughs> what's, our, what's our official statement on that? Yeah, yeah, I, we definitely spoke to, to Bill, and uh, Bill is not running for lieutenant governor, and yeah, we've recruited like yeah. we've recruited somebody who we're like super excited about, and yeah. we're trying to keep it under wraps for like one more day while we plan the rollout, <laughs> and we're trying to do like a big media splash, and like we're going to come out with our petitions tomorrow, and uh, lieutenant governor candidate who's going to bring a lot to the ticket and provide a really great contrast with uh, Kathy Hochul as a great immigration story yes. and he's a great guy who wants to be lieutenant governor and maybe has a decent shot at it. Yeah. Sorry, my only hesitation is I didn't know where we were yeah, yeah, yeah. on that, but thank you. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, then. Yeah. Uh, you said after, not to be too microscopic about oh, this, no. but you said after I'm done with fundraising and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, it, and uh, I apologize if I don't, if something's up on your website that I haven't yeah. seen yet, but uh, your, your fundraising is going to be aimed like Obama's once was decades ago, and uh, young, uh, at small donors and so yeah. on, you're going to... Yeah, I should, I should brag on myself a little bit. I would say in 2004, I was the director of online organizing for Howard Dean's campaign, yeah. and uh, it's a kind of campaign that I want to run, but maybe better. Now, we can't be like Obama because we don't know really, well, we aren't going to have, you know, 15 million in resources in three months. You know, I have a pretty ambitious fundraising plan, but you know what that means? is it actually means more empowerment of the volunteer base. Is that we're really going to rely on groups, we'll provide the template, but rely on groups strategizing in their own community and figuring out in their own community how to get votes and raise money. My fundraising plan is this. The first two weeks are of higher dollar donors. That's just the way that you have to work. You have to start with some basis so that we can bring on the online organizers that we need. But after that, as much as possible, I want to engage people who bring in the $5 donations. One minute for a quick story. Okay. One minute, and then we'll have the last question. We'll okay. On that. okay, I'll be really quick. The base of the Statue of Liberty, you know that story? So it was supposed to be built by uh, you know, 100 rich men in New York, and they couldn't get it together. And so Joseph Pulitzer put out a call in the papers because the, the statue is being sent over saying, anybody who can give, please give. And there were these five cent, 10 cent things sent in from people all over because they wanted the foundation of liberty. That to me is the foundation of liberty. Like we need to be funding campaigns with people uh, giving $5 contributions and $10 contributions, not giving $120,000 contributions. I'm not gonna turn down any $120,000 contributions. <laughs> But my heart is in engaging people, both as volunteers and contributors. Rachel, last question. Um, I wanted to ask you, I was also involved with the Dean campaign. I was the co-chair of the LGBT oh. committee. And um, I remember Iowa so distinctly. Yes. Uh, not the screen, but you're the screen. You're playing me? No, no. <laughs> um, but I assume you're going to try and leverage some national organizing resources and how 
what is your plan to deal with those, um, you know, the allegations of carpet bagging that were so potent in Iowa? How, how are you planning on addressing that strategically and policy-wise? You don't mean Howard's, you mean mine. I mean yours, yes. <laughs> I mean, no, I don't mean Howard's. Right, he can answer for his own. No, all right, so I've been here for five years. Yeah. And uh, I had thought about running for office before. If they had, had, uh, hadn't approached me, I probably would have waited a few more years. But New York has a very long tradition of electing people who have not spent as much time in New York even as I have. I am sorry, I don't even mean about you individually. Oh, okay. I mean if you're bringing in national volunteers oh. from around the country, oh, okay. that tension between oh, that locals tension. and national. Oh, she's talking about something specific in Iowa 10 years ago where Howard Dean ended up using people out of state. I'll be honest with you, I actually want to make this a New York State effort. I actually think that's where the power is. And I think one of the real values of this campaign, besides winning, making and beholding this man to at least basic democratic standards is actually helping build the infrastructure of places like this. And you guys are actually a real model. I'd like to see more of this kind of group elsewhere and help seed that. You know, there's all these seeds. And if, if I can do anything, it's to help build a structure that can last not just, you know, three months, but several years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.